Good evening, everyone. We'd like to welcome you on behalf of Office of Global Affairs and Center for International Studies to this evening that we've all been looking forward to for a long, long time. Welcome all of you. But in a very typical Indian tradition, we would like to begin this evening by offering our salutation to Goddess of Knowledge, Saraswati, by chanting a small hymn, a prayer, to give ode to her and invite her to this August ceremony so that she can bless all of us here to continue with the mission that we are. Thank you. And I would invite Sahiti to do the prayers for us, please. Ya kundendu tushara hara dhavala Ya shubhra vastran vita Ya vina varadanda mandita kara Ya Shweta Padmasana Ya Brahma Chuta Shankara Prabhriti Bhir Devai Sada Poojita Samapatu Saraswati Bhagavati Nisesha Jatya Pahar. Thank you. So that was a lovely way to begin, which I will know will be a really lovely evening. So welcome, everybody, to the inaugural Koshal, Raj Koshal Lecture Series. Um, my name is Lorna Jean Edmonds. I go by LJ. I think everybody knows me as LJ. Um, I have, indeed, the honor to be your Vice Provost for Global Affairs the director of the Center for International Studies and a professor in the College of Health Sciences and Professions. But tonight's theme is really about understanding, storytelling, giving, and India is at the heart of this event. Um, at the end of the evening, we're going to invite Raj up and I'm gonna ask him to just articulate a little bit of the history of this special endowment. But I do want to say that an endowment doesn't come to anybody unless they've made a huge contribution and a special contribution. And this contribution was from one of his students. So there's no more special way to acknowledge academic excellence than for a student to come back and say, I'd like to give back to Ohio. And by giving back to Ohio, he wanted to elevate our understanding about India and its place in the world. And so we have this incredible evening tonight to get to feel a little bit of India in the room and enjoy the experience of hearing our keynote speaker, Banu Kapil. And so what I would like to do is I would like to invite Samya Pant back up and she is going to introduce our keynote speaker this evening. And just let me give you a chance though, I'd like to introduce Samya because um, my colleagues wrote, I thought, just a really nice synopsis of you that I would, if you don't mind, I would like to share. Um, Samia is an activist, a teacher, a mother, and a woman who loves to engage with students and see them emerge as global citizens. Samia has a PhD and master's from Ohio University, go Bobcat, focusing on communication for social change and interpersonal communication. She's the acting interim director of our communications and development program in the Center for International Studies. And I know I can see a couple of students from that um, program here tonight. She's also a faculty member in media and art studies in the um, Scripps College of Communication. But I have to say, I th just think this was a very eloquent summary 
of a really delightful colleague who joined the Centre for International Studies, and I too have had the pleasure to, I think, have her as my colleague and as my friend, and tonight she dressed me in a sari. So that's, <laughs> that's quite special. For anybody who knows what a sari experience is like, it's quite deep and personal. Um, but look how elegant it is. Is this not the epitome of India? <laughs> Yeah, I think that elegance with thoughtfulness is very much um, the story of India that we're going to hear about. And it's just really an honor for us to have uh, Samia do the introduction of our keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you, LJ, for that introduction. This is a very tall task, to introduce someone who, according to me, does not live in one dimension is a very difficult idea to grasp. So I'll do my best. Uh, a lot of this was going to be very rehearsed and was going to come from a lot of research about Bhanu online, on Google, through our center of folks. And then I met her today, and something happened. And I realized that it was very petty of me to try and think of her just as a scholar who's visiting us and bestowing us with her presence tonight. So I will try my best to uh, capture some of the emotions that I experienced with, uh, with Bhanu today. I'll begin with a quote by Sadhguru. Only the physical has here and there. Only the physical has now and then. That which is not physical does not subscribe to all these limitations. Meeting Bhanu today has been an experience that can only be defined in spiritual terms. The whole spiritual process is to go beyond the physical, to know something that is not physical. That which is not physical has no dimension. That which has no dimension has no sense of here and there, now and then, and nothing like that. Again, being with her through the day felt celestial, and that's not often how we feel living in today's everyday life. So thank you for making me feel that way. So who is Bhanu Kapil? She is a wonder, a figment of time that has no end or beginning. She is the energy. She is a mother who nurtured with care a son. She is a daughter who gives unconditionally to her parents and her mother at the moment. She's a mentor who teaches passionately, and she's a woman who humbles the creation with her depth, warmth, and charm. Ultimately, she is the Shakti, the force that is feminine and stable. Bhanu Kapil is a British Indian writer and poet who is currently at the University of Cambridge, where she is the Judith E. Wilson Poetry Fellow in the Faculty of English. She has a BA from England's Lugborough University and an MA in English Literature from SUNY Brockport. She has taught poetry, fiction, and performance since 2000 at Naropa University, where she is an associate professor as well. Bhanu has authored a number of texts, and it was so beautiful this morning when the students who interacted with her brought the book and had the honor to get it signed by her. And some other students were actually asking me, can we buy that book here locally so that we can quickly get it signed by her? I said, soon, my friend. So most importantly, she inspires whoever she meets. The students who interacted with her and they're sitting back there with her this morning were mesmerized with her interaction. Let me put it this way. I entered the room at the very end of the session because I didn't want to be any kind of hindrance in the energy that was flowing between the mentor and the mentee. And when I entered, I saw the session being concluded with an ode to Mother Earth, where Bhanu was offering water to Earth and its underground tributaries, as she said. This was done to protect the dreams of these students who had shared very open and with full vulnerability things that they were thinking of, imagining, and this is how she was paying respect to those ideas. Without much ado, I would like to invite her on the stage by reciting a couplet by Rumi, as this would aptly, hopefully, open the stage to her talk that I know centers around the idea of love. If destiny comes to help you, 
live well. If destiny comes to help you, life will come to meet you. A life without love isn't life. Bhanu Kapil, everyone. Good evening. Yes, I am Banu Kapil. Um, my face, next to some yellow roses, has been glimmering out of you as you're, you've been wandering around the corridors of your university. It's just a cell phone snap from a holiday last year. And um, it's hilarious everywhere. <laughs> I'm like, why? Well, um, if I had more courage than I do actually have, um, I would just fling this talk into the air right now and just begin again. Um, nevertheless, I must begin, um, and I can see that you have decimated the Gobi Pakuras, um, the remnants and carcasses of cauliflower bhajis are everywhere to be seen. Um, but before I begin, I'll, I'd just like to say thank you to LJ, Soumya, Ji Young, everyone who contributed to making this space possible, and um, uh, also Miriam, is it, who made this beautiful um, gold and red shimmery vortex behind me. So um, thank you to all the staff um, who made this evening possible. Thank you and the person who made this Rangoli-style flyer. Oh, hello. Thank you. What's your name again? Bree. Bree. Thank you, Bree. So, um, normally I have my computer, but I couldn't bear to bring it, and so I've written the whole thing by hand, so please bear with me. I tried to write it out again as I flew over the Atlantic and once more in Athens, Ohio, in my hotel room. So I might lose my place um, and then find it again, which is tradition, I think, if you're an immigrant daughter. Notes for a stranger before they have arrived, a talk created for Dr. Koshal and his community in Athens, Ohio, on November the 21st, 2019, though it's not that day as yet, though it is now. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the occasion of this talk, which is a celebration of the life, work, and service of Dr. Koshal, and to say that I am profoundly moved to be a part of what it is tonight to honor an elder from my own community and heritage. Dr. Koshal, in fact, I am a failed Punjabi housewife from the South Old Broadway and the Colorado mountains, um, but I'll try my best. And to be perfectly honest, I did recently learn how to make rajma in an Instapot, so <laughs> making a comeback, much to the relief of my son, I spent the last 10 years adding garam masala to box after box of Annie's macaroni and cheese. Um, he insisted that I stop, so I did. Yes. Um, it is um, one of the very much more remarkable invitations a poet typically receives um, to be here reading this talk to you a room filled with the beloveds, students, friends, and family of Dr. Koshal, who, from everything I've come to know about him, 
is one of the kindest and most generous men that anyone has ever met in their whole lives. You are loved, Dr. Koshal. The people in this room trust you and believe in you. Something that was palpable to me as I tracked the bright, wide, and lovely feeling of being here all day, on this night now, and in this room. Dr. Koshal, I can't also begin this talk without speaking to the astonishing coincidence that also compelled me almost instantly to say yes. Yes to coming here and yes to writing a talk. And it's this. My own father passed away 21 years ago, almost to this day. And what really strikes me again this evening is that you are precisely the age that he would have been if he had not died. And if your initials are RKK, then I hear his KK hidden inside those. When my father died, we lost our family home in London. My mother returned to India to care for her own father, and my sister and I found our way to the States. For many years, it was rare for me to meet someone from a similar background and rarer still to share space with an elder, something that I was raised of, raised to think of as a tremendous gift. But also I felt something like a vault of pink lightning, a sense of purpose, if that's the right word, for the feeling you have when you know you must do something, that you must leap, that you must write, as the poet Reina Maria Rilke said. When I read in your bio, Dr. Koshal, that in 1947, you had traveled from Pakistan to India as a refugee. This is a journey that my own mother took as a child, a journey of such horror, deprivation, and risk that I felt its imprint even on the life I lived as a child, the daughter of the mother who saw and experienced these things. Perhaps I still feel it now, as a mother myself and as the daughter of an elder, whose memories of partition have so curiously not weakened or faded with time, but instead have become, in the last few years, more vivid, specific, and intense. Sometimes I think I became a poet as a way to gather fragments, collect shards, and to understand what happened to my family as the result of a singular, fleeting glimpse, my mother's glimpse, that is, through a hole in the side of a cart. She was hidden beneath the hay, instructed not to look out of the cart or to make a sound from where she was within it. Her own mother put a hand over her, my mother's mouth, and yet, nevertheless, through a hole the size of a quarter, my mother saw a woman tied to a tree, row after row of women tied to the trees just before the border, then known as the Radcliffe Boundary Award, and of course, because a border is also a mirror just after it. I won't say here the details of what she saw because I'm aware that children are in the audience and because I, as a child, was not prepared for the stories of what my mother saw that she was not supposed to see. But also, these details are precisely that, tiny things. As I approached this talk, I did not imagine for one moment that I'd be writing about this, a glimpse and its aftermath. In fact, as a writer, I'm still trying to figure out what receives the blood in a book that nobody wanted to write, could not write, or avoided writing at all costs. This is a talk, not a book. And so perhaps it's enough to make contact with a witnessing consciousness and to state the obvious. Somebody had to survive in order to be here now. 
Notes upon arrival. What did you carry with you? What did you leave behind? I think of my grandfather in August, Lahore, 1947. His Muslim neighbors, his oldest friends, come to tell him, leave tonight before it's too late, now. And so he did. A scholar, a mathematician, a violinist, a watercolorist, a poet, he had spent his youth riding his muddy white Arabian horse into the hills and beyond. He returned always with poems of the cities and verges he traveled to painstakingly transcribing the poems of those places in his blotter pad in pale blue ink, then reciting those poems in Farsi, Pashto, Urdu, Punjabi, and even the language then spoken in what was then known as the city of love, Akshabat, Turkmenistan. Leave, now. And looking behind him into a room he'd never see again, he saw his library of notebooks, handwritten texts and books from the markets of Kabul, Old Delhi, Mutanabi Street, volumes sacred to his artist or adventurer heart. My mother said in an instant, he knew what he must do. He took the books from the shelf and he burned them. And then he scraped the ash into a lacquered box. And then he wrapped that box in a shawl and then he fled. And when he arrived, said my mother, he was so thirsty he drank three jugs of water in one sitting. And after that, well, everyone knows. He did not speak for two years. One day, he started to scream and did not stop. They locked him in a cage. The way that I understand this story is that whatever happened on my grandfather's precarious journey from Lahore to Delhi changed the shape of his brain. There's more to say about the way that the water in our bodies is responsive to the language we use and the images we perceive. But today, tonight, I'm simply curious about what it might take for this shape, this configuration, which hovers over my family constellation like a leaking star to break down completely or dissolve. Some bodies don't somatize, I wrote on the windowsill, tracing the sentence with my fingertip in the dust. Trauma is crystalline, I said to precisely no one. So, I guess I'm really here now, in the part of the talk where I can't pretend anymore that I know how this talk will end or what I'll know or what we'll know at the end of it, together or near each other, afterwards or afar. And there's a part of me too that wants to know what happens if you begin with nothing, leave with nothing, and start from that place. Is it possible to become a poet just by leaving your house, or do you have to leave your house forever to make that so? Because it's not possible for me to be in this talk alone, I'd like to call in a friend to help me with the next bit, the bit where I'm wondering what it will take to thaw the frozen ice around my own heart. I'm thinking in particular of my friend, Syra Pinto, an indigenous activist and a leader in the field of organizational change, with whom one afternoon, Three years ago, I took a freezing, briny walk along the gray frill of the Boston shore. Syra came to the US from Central America as a child on a precarious journey of her own, during which, crossing a river, she almost drowned. She has a vivid memory of holding her breath beneath the water, watching the aquatic otherworld life of the river passed before her in a moment of complete stillness and peace. She was upside down. A gold, silver, and lime green fish 
with scarlet and black freckles on its belly, floated past the tip of her nose, a fish I can describe so vividly because she herself described it to me. Perhaps now you can see it too. Perhaps you were once a child. As we walked along the foaming edge of the Atlantic, Syra paused now and then to pick up one of the large white shells with corrugated ridges, then hold it to her ear. We'd been talking all day about the things we always talk about whenever we meet. Transformation as something that happens at the level of the cells. Audrey Lord, what did you survive to be here? Ramon Sensei, how do you metabolize the transgression that you know has already occurred. And somewhere in the midst of that top level chat, Syra turned to me and held out a shell. Listen, it's how the ancestors speak to us. What do you hear? What do they need? And it was then that Syra said something that I memorized on the spot, knowing that I'd need to return to her words again and again as I return to them now. She said, the ancestors need us to grieve for them, but they need us to dream for them too. One or the other is not enough. The ancestors need us to grieve for them, but they need us to dream for them too. One or the other is not enough. And in our work and in the life that we might live, how do we do that? How do we grieve something and dream something at the same time? How do we complete what we could not complete at the time? A conversation, a journey. The summer before he died, my father and I were planning a pilgrimage to Badrinath. We talked for hours at the kitchen counter waiting for the yogurt to set, getting up to stir the milk on the stove every now and then. I felt so grown up. He even poured me a glass of freezing cold white wine. I didn't realize it at the time, but it was the first and last time that I would ever speak to my father in a real way, as an adult or a woman, and so perhaps that's what I'm grieving in this talk how exhausted my father was, what it took to make a life like that in the England of that time. I was never able to tell my father that I too had experienced uncertainty, violence, loss, or that I became a poet as a way to make sense of all the leaving, arriving, never arriving, what it was to go. Even in this talk, I'm aware of my instinct not to expose entirely what it was my body experienced on this earth, or sensed, or knew. I don't even know if this evening, right now, when it's time to read these words aloud, if I will feel embarrassed or even ashamed to be talking about my father like this or how much it turns out that I have missed his presence all these years. Dr. Koshal, it was so extraordinary for me to sit next to you on the sofa today at LJ's house. I've discovered in such a short time that so many people in this community have had a chance to know you, to learn from you, to hear you say, I trust you, I believe in you, in the way and in the words that you yourself would use. Because isn't that the greatest gift a student could hope to receive from a teacher? The sense that their ongoing journey is something they have the capacity, imagination, and empathy to take. This afternoon, you said, a good teacher should always hope that their student goes on to do even greater things than them. And there, on the sofa in LJ's home, the vice provost's house with its 
Sri Lankan climped and the elephants beneath the chairs, perched on a cushion between you, Dr. Koshal, and your beautiful partner, Dr. Mrs. Koshal. I felt something I have not felt for a very long time. I felt something I really don't have the words for even now. I felt safe. And also, I felt in that room the love and the gratitude that are extended towards you both, of everybody there, your colleagues, your children, your community. This is what happens, I thought, when you stay in a place long enough to belong to it, to be absorbed by it in turn. Your son, sitting right next to you, at our lunch today, recounted many instances of the hospitality and care you and your wife have extended to newcomers, whether those were international students or complete strangers at the Greyhound station on the way to Kroger's. And I thought, yes, that's true. It's not just the story of a particular life, the way that one person's grief or one person's dreams accumulate, but rather this, the turn to others. In a time when so many people on this planet are fleeing economic and ecological devastation, and in a time when borders are coming down hard with the power and clang of a metal gate, perhaps this is the most radical act of all, to take pristine, pristine care of the strangers and newcomers, whoever they are. Dr. Koshal, you yourself shared a story of your own father today. You said, my father didn't worship in temples. He said, no temple. My religion is to help other people, try to help someone every day. And what would that look like? And how could that be? I'm thinking of the night in West London where I grew up, that we woke to a commotion on the street below. I remember the sari of the woman on the pavement, glinting emerald, and the gold at her ears and at her throat. The government van had dropped her off, and she and her family stood startled, blinking, in the strobe of the amber streetlights outside 76 Lansbury Drive. In the morning, we'd meet our new neighbors, recently exiled from Uganda with nothing, as the saying goes, but the clothes on their back. I remember that sari later in the week, drying on the line in the sun, crisp with a late frost, and refracting, or so it seemed, its own real light. Get away from the window, said my mother, then sent me over later with puris wrapped in a tea towel and chana, in a pale green ceramic bowl. In the Britain I have returned to so recently, such a scene is unimaginable. Members of my own long settled family, all of whom benefited from migration policy, the Commonwealth visa program of the 1960s and 1970s voted for Brexit. It's surreal to see a British Indian Home Secretary, actually, whose family was given refuge when they themselves fled, make social impassioned arguments for a hard border. Notes upon arrival, what will you remember? What did you forget? Perhaps it's time for me to contract the scale of my talk, to come back to the place where I began the connection with my own father and my own mother that I felt so intensely when I began to write to you before we met. This is not the talk I imagined I would give because now I'm in the taxi to Heathrow Airport and now I'm on the aeroplane flying across the Atlantic writing this talk on the pink paper. Below me, Greta Thunberg waves from her Atlantic yacht and I wave back. I didn't know when I began this talk that it would simply be this, a way to make contact 
with immigrant time, the ultra-specific memories of displacement, and also the intimacies, the radical intimacies of family life. I think of my father, the barefoot shepherd or goat herd, who went on to become the first Indian headmaster in the United Kingdom. Yeah, I get that. I get the fierceness it takes and the willpower, the curiosity, to disembark, then hitchhike from Athens to Calais in the time preceding this one. But I think also of my mother, whose early life was so disrupted by the elemental force of partition, all that blood absorbed so quickly by the forest floor and even the tracks of hard-baked dirt beside the railway platform. If I was a musician, I would collect the sound of rain in Lahore and mix it with the sound of rain in Delhi on a breezy day. I think of my mother, who was married to a man she met only five days before, and who by the end of that August, August 1967, was relocated so abruptly that the shock of it is also a sign, also a watermark, still releasing its vapor and color, its intensity into our lives. Suddenly she was living in a third floor cold water walk up without running water or access to a kitchen in a London that was not, after all, as she had believed in her innocence, paved with gold. My father, who had grown up in deep poverty without sisters, had no idea what to do with a pregnant wife. And so each day before leaving for work, he'd set out a bottle of PLJ, a sort of health drink comprised of diluted lemon juice, and switched the TV on, wrestling on Saturday afternoons so that the, my mother could learn English. They had no blankets. My mother did not have a coat or shoes that closed. By this time, the weather was growing cold. And it was there, on a bench, one freezing October morning, that Catherine Eccleston, the wife of a local minister, found my mother shivering in her sari and weeping, her bridal henna beginning to fade. And this is the story of how it is that I am the person giving this talk. I'm giving this talk because Catherine Eccleston sat down next to my mother on that bench, took her hand in her own, and surmised in about two seconds that this was a person who needed care and love and support. Catherine Eccleston was Welsh from Chlandudno. She tended towards kilts and dark pink cashmere sweaters and lily of the valley perfume. She walked my mother home, took one look at the situation, and returned with a duvet, socks, a coat, boots, gloves, and food. She and her husband befriended my traumatized mother and my gorgeous, blustery, and fierce father and had them over for tea every Sunday afternoon. And then when I was about to be born, the Ecclestons sat my parents down and John Eccleston said, listen, Kapil, we've been talking and it's not possible for you to take a baby back to that house. And so we'd like you to come and live with us. Yes, we'd like you to live with us when the baby comes, come and live with us in our home. And so it was. And so it was that two months later, when I was still a baby, this extraordinary couple, the Ecclestons, sat my parents down once more and told them that what they'd really like to do is to give them their house, which they did, for a nominal sum, something like a present day $15 or 10 pounds. And then they moved out to another house three streets away. Economically, my parents were then able to move forward in their lives. Every morning they made their tea and after about eight years of that, they sold up and moved to another area, the neighborhood with better schools and so on, when I was about 10. The neighborhood I grew up in has on the occasions that I visited it 
become a sort of shell, as if it had been scraped clean, then poured over with imperfectly mixed concrete, something like the opposite of gentrification. It was in that neighborhood that Britain experienced its first race riot in an Asian community, the riot of April the 23rd, 1979, in which the anti-racist protester, Blair Peach, a teacher from New Zealand, was killed. I remember holding my father's hand in the Dominion Cinema as we filed past the coffin of Blair Peach for a glimpse of his soft white face. I remember the smell of Auntie Catherine's perfume and the blue wallpaper with the yellow flowers that carpeted, or so it seemed, 76 Lansbury Drive. And all of this is to return again to the simplest possible idea of hospitality as an antidote to unbelonging. It's almost not possible to imagine in the time we are living in now a white English family giving up their home or making space for a brown immigrant family. In fact, it might be the other way around. I think of my cousin's wife from Mathura who has lived in London for almost 20 years and her aversion, for example, to the new wave of immigrants from Poland, Croatia, and Iraq who fill her neighborhood now. I think that yes, this is the turn I want to take next at the very end of my talk written on pink paper above the very sea. I want to make a turn to others and especially those radical others who don't always resemble us because the border is what I'm grieving in this talk but it's also what I want to dream. This spring, with the support of a childhood friend who now works for the US State Department, I'm going to take a train from Amritsar to Lahore, reversing a line in time, the journey my family took during the partition of undivided India into India and Pakistan. This is what I want more than I want to write another poem. I want to drink a cup of tea, a cup of cha made with sonf perhaps, or bara elaichi, the black husk pounded down before it's added to the hot water then boiled with milk. I want to drink this tea on the street where my ancestors lived in the place where they were and lived, washing their clothes in a bucket, playing the violin so that the head of it pressed into their stomach gathering on Thursday evenings to sing Kavali, listen to Kavali all night long, or perhaps my ancestors were a miserable lot and fought amongst themselves like young children in the hot afternoon, whoever they were, they lived there. They are not ghosts. There where they lived and where a flesh memory of their lives resides, perhaps in the form of stories the stories that are told in my family, and perhaps in yours too, Dr. Koshal, I want to drink a cup of tea. And when I've finished it, I want to set it down. Perhaps I'll throw the dregs of it into the rose pink or dull brown of the dirt itself, and then I'll get up, and then I'll go home. And that's it. That's the end of a poem I want to make with my own body in the middle of my own life. Dr. Koshal, thank you for the line you made with your own body and your own life, the one that brought everyone here together this evening. Your humanity, your kindness, and everything I've come to learn about your life will stay with me for a very long time. I'm thinking about what your life can teach us about what it is to get to the part where dreaming is not an ancient technology, but rather a fact of ordinary life, lived with and for others without asking anything in return. What is it I'm learning from you to create the conditions under which 
beloveds, strangers, newcomers of all kinds might arrive and be received in turn. Dr. Koshal, perhaps you are a poet too. That's the end of my talk. Well, what do you say after something like that, honestly? Um, you know, I, you, you think about the people that we select, and I, and I have to be really grateful to a couple of people who are in the room tonight. Um, I'm pleased that Devika Chavla was able to be here. Taka Suzuki, is he still here? I, he might have had to go. But also, also Matthew Rosen and Brian Collins were the faculty members that helped us choose who would be the right person to honor our Raj Koshal and the inaugural Koshal Endowment. And I have to say, I can't imagine anybody other than Banu. Thank you. That was truly a remarkable <laughs> presentation. You know? I, I couldn't help hear in this conversation that you had just how alive it was. You brought your past you brought your near past, you brought your journey, and you brought your today, and you brought Raj into your life in a way that I think in the room we all felt part of this story this evening. And you know, that's the best part about our global world. And that's the best part about Ohio University and that's the best, best part about the faculty and the students and staff who come to Ohio and are part of the Athens community. Because what you spoke tonight, I think we all believe. I think we all feel like we belong here. And you were just able to eloquently make us all feel like welcomed immigrants to the Athens and Ohio community. So thank you again, Banu, for making this one of the most memorable inaugural events for Raj. I don't think he and his family will ever forget this evening. For those who are part of International Education Week, this is the seventh year that we've celebrated and had a gala speaker, and I think tonight was also one that we will never forget. You've ended the week on such a powerful note. So on that note, I'd like to welcome Raj and yourself back up to the stage because we have something that we would like to give you, just a special token of our appreciation, please. Just don't trip either of you. <laughs> So it's a shawl from India that Sonia brought back. <clears throat> and then we also have just a little. 
little fast and you can hang up. Yeah, here is something to remember. <coughs> Athens, Ohio. <laughs> you see? Thank you, Banu. Well, <coughs> I want to thank our Vice Provost Edmund. She has done more than what I could imagine for this inaugurational lecture or series. She has gone all the way to throw love, affection, and all this what you see, decoration and food and uh, inviting people. Her staff has been great in getting everybody involved. <clears throat> now, it is really a surprise at the same time pleasure to have this talk today because uh, I and Bhanu couple just talked for 15 minutes and we exchanged our ideas or talking to each other, we found everything is clicking. What she had experienced about her father, same I went through that. So it is a remarkable thing how you presented that, you see? And uh, I think everybody will agree that her presentation was excellent and uh, nobody could do better job explaining how people came or these refugees, you see, uh, are coming from different countries or we experienced. I was 13 years old when this happened, that we had to move from Pakistan uh, to, I mean, Pakistan was not there. You see, India was divided into kind of three parts. And uh, I was 13, and you can't imagine, and I don't want to even think how hardship, how much bloodshed I have seen in my life. So, Bhanu has done a very good job explaining about these refugees. Today also we are facing the same problem, you see, all over the world. And I hope better days should come for these people also who are suffering today. And uh, I would also like to thank all of you to come and listen to our honored speaker who has done a wonderful job to explaining how feeling is there of people who suffer. And then they enjoy a good life also. You see, that's a remarkable thing in my opinion. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> Our provost is here and uh, Thank you for coming. You see, it's a great pleasure to see all of you come here and come to this inaugural uh, talk. And this was, as uh, Edmund explained, this was really started with by one of the students. You see, without asking me, he gave the money, big amount, you see. $50,000, and today, with the help of other family members and uh, friends and students, it has gone to 100000 So it's a really honor for a professor when he sees that his students are appreciating what he, they learned. So thank you very much for coming to this talk and spending time with us. And now I think, uh, question no, answer, yeah. yeah. She will ask for you people, whosoever have questions to come. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs>
So now we can say all the official speeches are over, and now we would, I just know there, there are probably people in the audience who would love to ask you a few questions. So Ben, if I can welcome you back up, we'll try and field questions from our group, and then, you know, in the next, we'll just see how the universe unfolds. Does that work for everybody? Okay, please, Benu. So I gather if you want to ask questions, there's a mic there and a mic there. So who would like to be the first person to come forward? Don't be shy. Somebody has to have a question. Well, I'll ask a question. Perfect. Do I, you need to come here. Actually, we probably, just because we're to Thank you for your fabulous talk, uh, performance, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just curious about your writing process and uh, anything you would like to say about it. Um, well, you catch me at an awkward moment. <laughs> I know. <laughs> where I'm coming to the end of my fabulous career as an obscure Asian-American poet. <laughs> um, and it's confusing to answer that question here in I, Ohio. I, um, I've just returned to England after 29 or 21 years and um, I think I came to the limit of uh, writing about diasporic memory or diasporic time in Colorado or New York or San Francisco um, because there was nothing here that reminded me of the place that I was from. I wrote a book set in Midnapur about the wolf girls of Midnapur, two girls who were found living with wolves in the 1920s. And I would wander through the Ponderosa forest of Colorado pretending that it was a sal forest in West Bengal, slightly unsuccessfully. Um, so I have made a turn to performance as a way to just shift time in my own body. Um, so that's what's happening now, except that um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I want to keep writing in the way that I did. And I think there's a way that being an experimental writer or an avant-garde writer is a way of thinking about fragments and how fragments attract. And I'm thinking about a quote that means a lot to me from a talk by M. Nobese Philip, a Canadian Caribbean writer who said, I've memorized this as well, I wrote it on a napkin, the purpose of avant-garde writing for a writer of color is to prove you are human. So stuff like that's been going on. Um, uh, and we'll see a little bit I'm thinking, what would it be like to write something from beginning to end? Um, and that maybe I'm at the part of my experience as a writer that's about integrating these fragments. And so, um, uh, please stay tuned. I hope to one day meet Salman Rushdie as a result of writing some intelligible novel that it's not looking good, because I'm like 51 and you know, just now learned how to make Rajma. So. Who knows if I'll ever be able to <laughs> write a novel. Thank you. Thank you. Aha, somebody is approaching the microphone. Hi, Banu. Hello. Thank you for this morning. It was lovely. Yes. Um, but you never had the opportunity to talk about your dream. So Banu this morning asked us what we dreamed of. And now I want to ask you, what's your dream? Mm. It's really amazing. My dream is to spend tomorrow night watching Netflix with my son in Washington, D.C. <laughs> I so strangely reverse emigrated, and then at the same time my son went to university. So I really miss him. So it's like a really localized dream called wake up, go to Washington, D.C. And I'm really grateful that whoever made the arrangements made it so that I could have a stopover in Washington, D.C. Um, but my larger dream, I think I was trying to say about that vision at the end of the talk, it's like a, it's like a strange idea because like that border, 
It's as if you're not allowed to think about it or remember it, and for obvious reasons. Uh, but I find that that um, quality, and maybe that's uh, what people are speaking about when they speak about inherited forms of trauma, like there are lots of silences in my own family system. And I, it's just come into my mind that if I can like go back in time, um, if I can just take that train journey um, or take that trajectory, if I can just, I mean, it won't take longer than half an hour to have that cup of tea in Lahore. Um, I just have this feeling that it would uh, maybe be part of not only what it is to disclose something, but also to discharge it as a writer or an artist. I don't want to kind of rewrite the trauma of my family, but um, if it's there, if it comes out, and I think my talk is kind of like a bit serious, or like these kind of waves of strong feeling came through, and maybe that's a bit to do with the vulnerability I feel at this time of my life, like back in the country that I left for a reason. Um, so what I'm dreaming about is um, what it would be to write something that would allow me to write myself out of one life and into another. Um, but also the great mystery of Athens, Ohio is upon me. And uh, <laughs> just something about belonging and what it is to allow yourself to be absorbed by a place, not just to take it in, but to let it take you in. Stuff like that is going on at the back of my heart. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you, Vanu. Thank you, beautiful friend. <laughs> no. uh, so as a poet, you have shared a piece of your life with us today, and we are so honored for that. How do you replenish yourself? This is the same thing, hello, um, that I thought might be a useful thing to think about with the extraordinary students that I met in the morning. I replenish myself by inverting myself above rivers. I could mention the Rhine outside Frankfurt. I could mention the Big Thompson in Colorado, and I'm working up to the Thames. I replenish myself through solitude and prayer. I replenish myself through just sitting around with the people that I care about. Um, but really just staying in contact with the mud and water of the world. And if you saw what was happening in Cambridge, you would see that there are stains of red clay on the floor of the drama studio where I'm teaching a seminar this, this term. Um, so inversion, friendship, love, water, tea, and a specific form of loneliness. Something just happened. Did a portal just open to another dimension over there? <laughs> I think it was your cell phone. Yeah. Um, and maybe I just want to remember the quote that we said this morning um, from Audre Lorde, that, um, just the idea of radical self-care. And so I think like last night, I got into Athens at just past six, and my instinct was to gut it out. Come on, Banu, wash your face with cold water, get yourself to the gala, because that is about like, it's a profound duty and a profound honor to be here. But at that moment, I also felt my duty to the students that I had not met in the morning and to the reception and to being here now. That was the deepest duty. So I really understood that I had to rest. So I just, um, I just listened to my body. And um, it's about being here. I, I just follow the yes, and I listen to the no. The French writer Marguerite Duras said very mysteriously, to write is to refuse life. I still don't know what that means, but um, I'm having a go. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
I, I thought that was quite a good question to ask because I, I must admit when she was talking, I was thinking of all the energy that it took for her to put together this very thoughtful evening. But I have to say on my own, from my own perspective and maybe from the people in the room, I feel replenished. I feel like my cup is fuller than it was before I arrived tonight. Because you, I think, gave us your energy. So thank you for sharing your thoughts and your energy. And again, in closing, Raj, did you want to say something? Well, thank you. So this is the end of the evening. Thank you all for joining us for what has really been a really pleasurable evening. So good night, everybody. <laughs>